Hello, everyone. Um, I guess I'll just sort of jump right in here. So first of all, who am I? My name is Joseph Kahn. I was recently a student at U of T. I just graduated this past summer. Um, so I was sitting in this room many, many times last year. Um, I've been working at Wave for about two and a half years between a 16-month co-op there and working part-time and now working full-time after graduating. Um, and by the way, approach me later if you're interested. We are hiring. We're pretty awesome. So why don't I just uh, jump right into the topic. So what is sharding? Sharding is splitting your data across multiple databases. And there are two sort of main ways that you can accomplish this. Uh, one is if you split your columns or your rows. So you can either have the same schema across multiple databases and split your rows between them, or you can have different schemas on different databases and have all of the rows in that table on a single place. Um, so now, now that I've shown you how you can shard, sort of why would you want to? So first of all, you'll have increased number of connections. So more machines mean more connections, more simultaneous work can be done, which is pretty awesome. Your performance is going to increase because you're going to be querying smaller databases, or if you're you know, splitting up your rows, even smaller tables. And then also, your data is just going to grow. You know, conventional hard drives only get so big. If you know, you're just sort of starting up your company and your data is growing, at first, it'll certainly fit on one hard drive. Later, maybe not. So scalability might be an issue, and you should solve it early. So why did we shard? Well, we were running out of physical memory, so that was a problem. But even more than that, we started doing queries, and they would be writing to disk. And that makes your application really slow. And users don't really like that. So we went through a whole painstaking process. And at DjangoCon 2013, our director of engineering, Ash Christopher, gave a talk about how we sharded with Django. So I'm just sort of going to start by talking about sort of the problems we had with our original implementation and then get into our new one. So our original implementation followed three steps. Our first was avoiding sharding entirely by scaling up. So moving to SSDs, moving to bigger hard drives, doing everything we could to avoid sharding, only pushing the problem off just a little further. Then we did something called feature sharding, where in Wave's example, maybe we put our invoices on one database and our financial transactions on another. And then eventually this also becomes a problem because now you have too many invoices. So then we had to shard across each of our really large tables. So some of the drawbacks. The first one was there was way too much required knowledge. So someone comes in, you know, maybe they started last week or a week ago, they've been making invoices on their machine, and then they pull master, there's an invoicing migration to run, they run it, and they just get an exception. It tells them the invoicing table does not exist. So that's kind of confusing. You know, why does this even happen? Well, what they tried to do was one manage PUI migrate, and that didn't do what they thought it did. What that really tried to do was run their invoicing migration on a database that had no invoices on it. It was extremely confusing, and new developers had to know how to do this in order to get by it. And the really confusing part about this implementation, and part of it was probably because Django was a little less mature and it used to use South as opposed to its built-in migration system, but you had to fake your migration on databases that the migration didn't apply to. So on your transaction database, you had to fake your invoicing migrations. It was just a very confusing implementation. One of the other problems was, you know, you look in the models.py file, there's no indication of which models are sharded and which aren't. The only way that we distinguished these two models was the app that you were in. So if your invoicing app is sharded, then all of the models defined in that app are sharded. But um, let's say your financial transactions app wasn't, then all the models there aren't. So it means you have to sort of separate things by whether they're sharded, not by their use case. And it's not intuitive when looking at that file what's really going on. Another problem was sometimes people would forget to add ID fields that um, had globally unique IDs. So if I had invoices on database one and two, they could have the same primary key value, which on the individual databases isn't a problem. But if you're trying to aggregate data from multiple databases and they all have the same ID, you can get into some interesting code problems, as well as when BI looks at it and they're trying to do some analysis, they're going to be equally confused about what's really going on in your data. Another problem, there were no docs. There were some sparse comments in the code. The code was sort of all over the place in different apps. It was very hard to follow and understand exactly what was happening. And then by extension, it wasn't extensible. So if I wanted to change something about the way 
let's say, the financial transactions were sharded as opposed to the invoices, it wasn't really straightforward how I might be able to do that. And then an even bigger question was, why did we even feature shard to begin with? So as I said before, you know, maybe our financial transactions are on one shard and our invoices on another. Well, that seemed like a good idea at the time, but it didn't actually provide any practical benefits. So what ends up happening is when we want to generate reports to do with all these things, we can't do joins, there's no foreign keys, and then if any of you have ever worked with Django transactions, especially pre like 1.6, they were pretty hard to deal with. And so you have to do a lot more manual work and it's really confusing about what's really going on. So we kind of regretted this decision in the end and would much rather have sharded maybe based on the user rather than the model that you're looking at. And then just as a very simple example, so it increases the code complexity a little bit, but if let's say you wanted to store all your sessions on another, hard, on another database rather than uh, you know, sharded across multiple databases, Django should know what to do with that. You shouldn't have to explicitly tell Django to look at the sessions database every time. There should be a way to do that. So we came up with a new implementation, which is currently on PyPI called Django sharding. It's uh, fully open source on GitHub, as you can see. And we have some pretty awesome documentation covering all the different parts and what's, uh, what's going on there. So why did we write this? There are a couple of pretty good reasons we went for this. One was in all our new applications, this is what we want to do. So we have some sharded applications, some unsharded applications, and some applications we're currently building. And for the applications that aren't sharded, we kind of want to move them into the sharded state because they're all growing, similar to the ones that, uh, that we already moved over. And for all our new ones, it just makes sense to shard them from the beginning. So we wanted something that was easy and reusable. We definitely wanted something that we could sort of uh, change on a per app basis if we wanted something maybe uh, in one of our apps but not another. And we couldn't really find any open source solution that suited all of our needs. There was nothing that was easily customizable. So we decided to write one ourselves. So I'm gonna go over sort of how we would get to, uh, to where we are in the package. So the first thing you would do if you wanted to shard a model is add your model to the, is add your databases to uh, the database config in Django. So we added two new keys to the databases config to allow you to define what your sharded models are. So the first one is the shard group. So let's say you're sharding all your invoices on database one through three. All of those will be in the invoices shard group. And then we also defined a primary key that allows you to specify if you have a replicate database, which, uh, which it is of. So the next thing that we're probably gonna need to do is label our models as sharded. So here is an example models.py file. You know, we may have a user that's inheriting from the abstract user, so we're just gonna extend the user to add this shard field so that we can shard by user, because that's, that's a pretty easy way to shard. And then we have these two models. We have our sessions and our invoice. So for sessions, we wanna store this on the sessions database. And for invoices, we wanna shard this because we know that invoices are gonna grow pretty large and we wanna get ahead of the curve. So the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is something that we can easily read. So we're gonna start by decorating our models. So on the sessions uh, definition, we're going to specify what database it will be stored on. And from the invoicing, uh, model, we're going to specify what shard group it is. And in this case, we'll just use the default shard group. So that's the first component. It's how do we label our models as sharded so that people can easily understand which models are sharded and which aren't. And then it will also do some verification on, uh, on runtime to allow you to make sure that you set this up correctly. The next thing that we're going to look at is sort of where we're going to store each user's data. So let's say we have two databases. Where is user one's data going to go? Where is user two's data going to go? So these are called sharding functions. And these are just functions that either pick a shard to store data, or they retrieve a shard of where you're gonna find data that you want to retrieve. And so very simply, it's just a class with two functions on it called pick shard and get shard. And then a very simple implementation of this is for get shard, we're just reading it right off the user model where we already decided we're gonna save the shard. And when we pick a shard uh, for a user, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna cycle through them. So this should roughly even out the load across all our databases. So that the first user gets database one, the second user gets database two, and it will loop back and distribute the load pretty evenly. The next thing we're gonna to need to do is we're gonna to need to actually save the shard to the user. So we added that field, but we never actually saved it. Ah. And so the next thing, the way that we do that is through an app config. So Django in more recent versions added 
app configs that you can load at runtime. So what we're doing is we're using Django signals in order to say, all right, every time we go to create a user, we want to use that, that uh, pick shard function that we just defined to decide what shard the user should go on, and then we're going to save it to the user model. And additionally, we're also going to do even more verification that things are set up correctly on more of an app-wide level. So again, we want things to explode when you try to start the app, not while you're running the app. We want this to be pretty predictable and easier to set up. So now what we need to do is generate our IDs. So before, I spoke about how when we didn't have unique IDs, and let's say we wanted to create a report, it became really hard to aggregate that data back together. So how would we go about generating these, uh, these IDs? And yes, they're very important. So we've created a bunch of fields. Uh, for this example, I've gone with the cool guy sharded ID field that just knows that it's a part of the shard group default. So there are many ways you can generate these GUIDs, a sort of simple example. And again, this is just a class with a function on it uh, called getNextID is what if I take the name of the database it's going to and a UUID and I append them together? Then I'm pretty much assured, as long as that field is unique in the database, that no matter how many databases I have, my IDs are globally unique, which is pretty awesome. Um, and there's one more thing that I saw not long ago. Pinterest put out a really interesting article about how they get around that problem. So what they do, instead of having globally unique IDs on an actual table is, they generate just local IDs, just using an auto increment field, and then when they want to reference something on another database, they actually build an ID out of the model that you're in, the database you're on, and the ID on that table. And so they don't use globally unique IDs, they just don't reference things by their table-driven IDs, um, which is kind of an interesting way to get around that problem, and something you could also use this package for. So the next thing we want to do is we want to access our data. We we now need to know, all right, we've sort of sharded it, we've decided on the IDs, now we actually need to use it. So the one thing that you're going to notice is everywhere you're going to see the using key now. This is a common thing that you're going to see in any multi-database Django project. So anytime you want to access data or you want to save data, you need to tell Django where exactly you're, you're looking at. So as an example, if you're going to read an invoice, then you're going to need to use on uh, right before the filter, uh, I'm using invoice.objects.using, and using is what tells it what database to look at. And then, by extension, like I said before, for the session objects, we don't want to have to use a dot .using database equals sessions database. We want Django to know how to do that itself. Because having to specify that everywhere when it's only one database seems kind of like a waste and just added complexity. So how we're going to do that is the next component, which is we're going to write a router to route our database traffic. So a router in Django is something that determines whether things can have foreign keys with each other, whether you're supposed to run a migration on a given database, and where you're supposed to read or write data given in some information about that model. And so I'm not really going to go through our implementation of it because it's a lot of code, but uh, it's made of these four functions. DB for read and write, allow, allow relation, and allow migrate. And DB for read and write and allow migration and allow relation, I'll get the model. And sometimes they get hints, but not always. So usually all you have to go on is that it is an invoice. And so often you still have to use the dot using keyword, even though you know, this is clearly somewhat sharding aware, the router just doesn't have enough information to ensure where it's supposed to go. And so as an example, so now that we have our router, um, in the instance when, let's say, you're trying to resave an invoice, and for some reason Django has somehow forgotten what database it read this information from, then it's going to need to know how to get that shard. So one of the things we're verifying with our decorator is that every one of these models has a get shard function. It's something which knows how to retrieve where to find its data. And in this case, it's just going to grab the user and look at the shard attribute. Uh, and that's how it's going to know where to read the data from. One of the next things that, uh, that we really need to do is handle our migrations. So migrations can, get, uh, can be pretty complicated, like in our first implementation where you needed to fake things everywhere. The migration command was kind of confusing, so we tried to mitigate these problems. So the, the last component, the migration command, is we made two small changes to migrations. One is that we added an all keyword to the command so that you can specify you want to migrate all your databases. And then we made that the default. So all it really does under the hood is it's looping over all of your databases and running migrate on them. 
and it's just making it so managed PY migrate does what you expect it to do rather than you know, having to ask the guy next to you what you're supposed to do when your invoices uh, migration won't run. And then there is one additional requirement as a result of this, which is data migrations, which are handwritten in, uh, in new versions of Django, you need to tell it the model you're acting on. So as an example, if you wanted to do something with the user model, um, you need to pass it the model name as a hint. And if you don't, uh, the migration is going to explode. In the router, it's going to complain that it wasn't given a model name, and it's going to tell you to go back and specify it. And using that, it's able to infer where to run these migrations. And then using the router and this migration, uh, it avoids having to fake the migration on any uh, database that it's not supposed to run on. Django is just smart enough to know what to do uh, for each of your databases. So now one of the things I wanted to talk about was shard rebalancing, which is a really interesting topic. And sort of one thing I want to talk about is do you really need it? So let's say your database is growing. You've got maybe one or two, maybe even just one, and it's reaching maybe 80% capacity. There's a couple of things you can do uh, when you split up your databases. You can just add new servers, you know, throw more servers at it. But then your first server is going to be at 80% capacity and the rest of them aren't. And it's just going to be an uneven load. So how are you going to deal with that? And that's what shard rebalancing really is. And so we've taken a bit of a different uh, opinion on how to solve this problem. So where to store your shards? There are two ways. You can either store them each on their own individual servers. You can store them all on one server. Uh, you'll get perform different performance benefits out of both. Um, so let's say on the same server, you're going to get smaller tables. But on different servers, you'll get more connections, uh, et cetera. But at Wave, we do a little bit of both. So let's say we have maybe 10 servers. Then let's say we have 100 shards on each server. And in that way, we can make sure that we're getting sort of the performance benefits of both. But how this solves the shard rebalancing problem, I'll provide a sort of smaller toy example. So why does each one have many shards? So let's say you had two servers, and each one had two databases on it. And they were maybe at 80% capacity each. So you wanted to add two more servers. The naive approach you can take is just to add two more servers, each with four databases on them. But it's a lot easier, even from an ops perspective, to do this. So instead of just adding these new servers, you can move the whole database from one server to another. And then in Django, all that is is the config value in the, in the settings.py file. It's just where to find the database. You don't need to deal with moving all of your objects and you know, keeping your foreign keys in check, and then copying your data and verifying it was copied. This is a lot, uh, a lot easier. Um, and this is still reasonable because it, it works, but unfortunately the router doesn't do everything you'd want it to do and more. So you can't really sort of mark a user as read-only while you do all these kind of operations and move around your data because the router isn't even always used by Django. So often, you know, when you want to move these, these are going to require downtime. And this is probably the fastest solution you can have to avoid the, the longest downtime possible. So an overview of what, uh, what we did. We added our database to Django. We labeled our models as sharded to make it clear which ones were and weren't. We decided where each of our users' data was going to be stored using our sharding functions. We saved the shard to the user using the app config. We generated globally unique IDs. We accessed our data using the using command. We wrote a router so that Django knew what to do with that information. And then we handled migrations so that our databases would be set up correctly. So the benefits of sharding are the performance gains are pretty awesome. Um, you're leveraging your existing tools rather than adding something new. So this is just using MySQL or Postgres in a smarter way rather than adding something else to the tool chain that makes your app maybe a little more, uh, a little more difficult to internalize. And then this isn't a super ops heavy solution for the same reason. You're not adding something to the, to the chain. And then as an added benefit, because you're getting these smaller tables, you can probably avoid caching for a little bit longer as well. Uh, so just putting something off. And then the drawbacks are mostly that, yes, you have to manage more machines. Even though it's not super ops heavy, this is still something you're going to have to do. And then you're going to have to use that using keyword everywhere. And you're going to have to keep track of the shard that you're on. Uh, it adds a little bit of complexity to the app, but the gains are well worth just, uh, just one keyword argument everywhere. So want to help? We're going to be at the sprints. Um, you can either come, maybe contribute to the project, add some of your own defaults, or I can help you set it up in your own application. Um, and then questions. So any of those?
just looking at the GitHub page for your uh, Django sharding, and there's no license file. What license is this under? I will add that after this talk. I have not decided. That is a very good question. Any other questions? All right. <laughs>